Hey, listeners, Hit the Books podcast is available everywhere you get your podcasts, including Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Apple Music, YouTube, and more. Be sure to tune in each week and like, rate, and subscribe. What's going on, everybody, and welcome back to Season 2, Episode 28 of Hit the Books, the podcast where we dive deep into the world of sports and sports gambling. Each episode, we break down the latest news and trends, providing expert expert analysis and commentary, and offer up our best bets and betting advice. Whether you're a seasoned sports better or just getting started, our goal is to provide you with the insights and knowledge you need to make informed decisions and come out ahead. So sit back, relax, and let's hit the books. This week, we wrap up what we saw in the NHL trade deadline more news in the NFL and NBA in March Madness Selection Sunday is this this is this weekend. We're very excited for March Madness to start next week, as well as a little golf action with the players this weekend. Lots to look forward to, so let's jump into episode 28 of this season by introducing my co-hosts Huff, Ace, and Mackie. Thanks for joining me here for another week, boys. Mackie, let's start it off with you back at home. Spring break, right? What do you got going on? What's happening? Yeah, it's nice to be back home for a little while during... Uh during spring break, but yeah, um, just getting into March Madness, getting into the conference tournaments. I know um, the last two days we've been killing it. We're 4-0-1 um, since conference tournaments have started, so the playoffs in college basketball are no joke, and we, we definitely um, we hold high accountability for the, for that um, for these uh, tournaments. So just getting started, March Madness coming up, getting excited for that. Other than that, um, not much going on. What's going on with you? All right, good stuff, Mackie. Let's shoot over to Ace. Ace, what do you got going on this week? Yet another week here on the show. Yeah, uh, like Mackie said, that college basketball has been heating up. Uh, kudos to him and Huff just in time for March Madness. I know we're all feeding that those picks to come out once the tournament gets going. But uh, two other sports that I've been keeping my eye on, I know that we've slacked a bit on the NHL card and the NBA card, but we'll get those back to double digits consistently and get some more green going. Excited to talk about some offseason moves and uh, the playoff race heating up in a lot of these leagues. So ready to go with the boys. Yes, good stuff. Yeah, NHL card has got to pick it up, but we're looking into it. We got the answers. Huff, let's finish it off with you for these intros. What do you got, buddy? Nice to hear from you. Yeah, not much going on with me. Uh, just been uh, watching a lot of college basketball these past two days, like Mackie said, as we get the conference tournaments underway. Um, other than that, we've had a successful day on the card so far, cashing uh, Davidson and Wake Forest and Colorado. So 3-0 and day so far on the college basketball card on uh, – or pushed Wake. Yeah, I forgot about that, that fucking minus three. But anyway, the 2-0 and 1, whatever you want to look at it, but – Great day to great way to start the day. Got a couple plays pending the rest of the night, but it's time for college basketball. March is finally here. Feeling good. Um, I'm excited for some some good basketball throughout the month. All righty, and as we all know, it is finally March Selection Sunday here this Sunday, March 12th. Real excited to jump into that. Why don't we uh, talk about a little college basketball here this week? Mackie Huff, what do you guys think is going to happen here coming into March Madness? Yeah, uh, definitely getting exciting as things are heating up. I know um, mine and Huff's picks. Baylor looks really good. That was Huff's pick. He got him at uh, plus 2,000. They've been playing some really good basketball. I got Arizona. I think it was, I think it was plus 1,800. I kind of forget what it was. But um, they've been, they have they dropped a few before the conference tournament. They, were, they haven't been looking the best, but I still really have a lot of confidence in them. I think they're one of the best teams up and down the, with their top five. Uh, they don't really have a soft spot. They're, them, Alabama... Houston, maybe those are the only three teams that don't really have a soft spot, but um, I'm still pretty confident in Arizona. How do you feel about Baylor, Huff? I I I think Baylor has a good shot, and I don't know the exact Big Twelve conference bracket. Just to I'm um, looking at the odds right now for some of the Big Twelve conference tournament winners. Obviously, Big Twelve is a powerhouse in college basketball, at least this year. Um, we've seen you know teams like Kansas, Texas, Baylor. Um, even TCU has upset a couple of teams throughout the Kansas season. And State? Kansas State's been yeah. in the top 10 for a minute. 
I was going to say Kansas State, Iowa State sitting right there. So I'll go through a couple of these. Uh, I think there's some value on uh, a couple of these teams here in the Big 12 Conference Tournament. Um, Kansas is the favorite, obviously, at plus 225 to win the Big 12. Texas at plus 300. Baylor at plus 450, still getting some disrespect. Obviously, Kansas has picked it up over the past couple of weeks. Uh, That big win against Texas, uh, there was many points. Uh, or that loss against Texas. There was many points I thought that Kansas team was going to come back into that game, and uh, they just Texas held their own defensively on their home floor and uh, got the job done. Texas is definitely no slouch in the Big 12, but I feel good about Baylor. I think they they could make a serious tournament run here. Uh, they still got Scott Drew coaching the team, and um, I really like that Baylor squad. But like you said, your your point about Arizona, yeah, they dropped a couple, a buzzer beater at Arizona State. Uh, lost to UCLA. We had them plus five and a half in that game, and they lost uh, to UCLA. But um, tough. It's been tough for Arizona, but the be- the cream rises to the top in March, and the better teams usually come to play later in March. And I think that's a team we'll be seeing uh, come, you know, Sweet Sixteen, Elite Eight time. I think we'll still be watching Baylor and Arizona play hoops. Yeah, I agree. Um, going off of uh, that Big Twelve tournament, who do you who do you think is going to come out of that for? Um... Just the conference tournament, nothing to do with March Madness. I I would probably go with one of the top two in Kansas or Texas. I think they take it. And me having a Baylor future, I don't know if you ended up taking it, but that Baylor with the Baylor future, I kind of I don't know if I want them to have their sights set on the the Big Twelve uh, tournament. But I mean, obviously, you never want to pick up a loss. Say there's a good. I don't know if there's ever a good time for a loss, but. Obviously, I'd rather them uh, focus up next week, next Thursday, when things uh, really come to matter. But I'd probably go with Kansas. I don't know about you. I just think they're rolling at the right time. Yeah, like since you have a Baylor's future, obviously you don't want them to end up winning the Big Twelve. You would you almost like to see a loss at that point. But um, just the way things line up, I really think Kansas gets bumped by WU in the second round. Um, really, you can call it a bias pick. Uh, it might be, yeah. But last time they played, it was in Kansas and uh, in Allen Fieldhouse, and WU gave them the a game two points. Yeah, yeah, they were they a nine-point underdog. That's a team that that has a lot of heart, and they need a few wins to get seated up in this bracket. I, they they might be in it already, but they're not solidified in any spot in this March Madness, and they have a lot of heart. And Kansas can easily drop one in the Big Twelve. You know, that's a team. Obviously, you're probably going to see them in um in Indianapolis. I'm assuming you'll see them in the bottom four. They're definitely a top four team in the league, but yeah, they could definitely drop one in the Big Twelve Big Twelve tournament. Uh, West Virginia is definitely a team that can steal one from them. So I'm going to go with Texas winning the Big 12 just because uh, I like Baylor going really far, too. I, don't, I, I think Texas will get bumped a little earlier in, the, in actual March Madness. So I think they get their championship here and then uh, just their just their highlight of the season. Yeah, I, de- I definitely would stick with Kansas or Texas, especially because, like I said, I'm already on Baylor for the Natty. So I don't really love them to win the Big 12 and the Natty. So for reasons like you said, but I think Texas at plus 300, that's a nice pick. So um the Big 12, obviously, it's going to be a gauntlet for whoever wins it, but it's going to be probably the best conference tournament out of them all, in my opinion. Um, another one that we've kind of been in and out of for conferences is the SEC in basketball. We've been taking teams like Georgia throughout the season and Kentucky a couple of times. Alabama, I know you've had, you've I been all over man. Alabama. and uh, or You've been all over fading Alabama lately as they've kind of touched this cold streak, and I've just it's a scary team, and I've kind of been against the most of those picks when you're bringing them, but um Alabama with a little bit of a cold streak to end the regular season but them obviously coming in as the favorite the heavy favorite to win the SEC uh tournament at plus 150 Tennessee right behind them well without Ziggler after tearing his ACL at plus 300 I don't know if I'm putting any value in Tennessee there uh you got Kentucky right behind them at plus 400 A&M at plus 500 and then it gets in uh Arkansas 12 to 1 and Auburn 14 to 1 just to round out some of the lower seeds but um, I'm going to keep do it simple with you, the uh, SEC. Go ahead. Do you have a bracket that I can look at? I'd love to see this bracket right now. Yes, you don't have the SEC funny, don't bracket. It. We could just talk about it, but no, I don't. I I was going to pull one up if we wanted. I do kind of want to see where, where Bama has to go because I like Bama in this spot. So, um, I'm looking up the SEC conference bracket because I do, I didn't know Kansas is going to get a spot with West Virginia. Uh, that's an interesting matchup. Obviously, that's not going to be a game I'm rooting for Kansas in. So, but um, I'm pulling this up right now. Let me take a look at this here. Who uh, just based on those odds? Do you have a pick or who? Anyone that you're like that'd be that's a decent play right there. 
Um, not really. The SEC is a little up in the air. Just one team I wanted to talk about was Tennessee. Um, that team just had so much promise halfway through the season. I think they were ranked top ten at one point, maybe even top five if I'm not mistaken. I could be off there, but um, they just completely fell apart. I had I actually made a futures bet for them in a parlay for them to win the um SEC regular regular season. They just fell off. I think they ended up in the five seed or something. Um, not a team that I would really like to bet on come March Madness. I think that they can be an early first round bump with a, but it's a team that had a lot of promise coming into the season and halfway through the season. It's really sad to see what they ended up working with. Yeah. And I just, I just sent you over the bracket and kind of looking at it. I do like Bama to get the thing, get things done in the SEC. Obviously they're going to have to go through the winner of Florida and Mississippi state. I'd probably lean on Florida there. Um, if they can get some of their guys back. But I think Bama's able to get pretty far, at least to the cha- SEC championship, maybe against a, a Kentucky or a Texas A&M, if Texas A&M can keep their magic going. Um, but I'm going to go with Bama out of the SEC. Yeah, I'm going to predict a Kentucky-Bama uh, championship game. I think Oscar Chibwe kind of puts the uh, Wildcats on his back for the first two rounds. Um but I do think Alabama gets their gets their SEC championship as well. This is a team that's been through a, a lot recently, and they haven't really been playing the best basketball. But I think, uh, you know, you know, Brandon Miller's still a top top seven player in college basketball, so um, he's going to do his thing. He's going to get to his spots, and he's going to make his shots. And I I really don't think the SEC is that competitive this year. I think that uh, they'll they'll looks like they'll have to play Mississippi State and Missouri or Tennessee, that Tennessee team that I'm not very fond of. And you'll get to Shibuya and the Wildcats in the championship. But I think uh, Bama will get their SEC championship, but I don't think they're going to make much noise in the, in the big, uh, big dance. Yeah, I agree. I do not have any other odds for any of these other tournaments because most of these games are underway, such as like Big Ten, ACC, all those ones. But, um, yeah, that's what's kind of annoying about that. But, I mean, like you said, our picks for the national championship, Baylor and Arizona, I still feel very good about both of those that we have on the card. and. Uh, college basketball cards have been rolling. So as we get into March and obviously conference tournaments throughout this week and the rest of the, uh, through this weekend, we get cha- or conference championships and stuff like that. And then Selection Sunday, we roll right into March Madness next Thursday. Uh, obviously, can't forget about the last four in uh, to start the week next week. So a lot of stuff coming from us from the college basketball world throughout this month. So definitely going to want to stay tuned on that. Um, but, yeah, that's that's kind of going to do it for me on the College Hoops card, Mackie, unless you want to go over a couple of recent plays or things you're liking. But, um, yeah. No, nah, I mean, we just – just all of this card, this is definitely our most confident card in, in my eyes, um, I think so. But um, we're really killing it right now, especially playoff basketball. We really – we know what we're doing. So looking at um, Wisconsin plus one and a half, I think we have it at plus two and a half, two, maybe against Ohio State coming up. So. They're Looking down early, in, but in playoff I think... basketball. Yeah, I'm not really worried about that. UNLV's caking, by the way. Yeah, UNLV is about to cash the money line. We just need that seed. Yeah, good stuff, guys. Huff, you said it. Lots to look forward to this month in the college basketball world from us, so stay tuned. Along with that, lots to look forward to as MLB opening day is approaching March 30th. Um, we're working on how we're going to address that here this season. Lots to look forward to here in the MLB picks and such as the season approaches. Let's jump into some NHL for this week. The first point I got here is after a big week in the NHL with all the trade deadlines coming and going or with the trade deadline coming and going, we see some teams that sold and some teams that bulked up all coming down to the NHL playoffs in just a few weeks. Uh, any comments here on the trade deadline? Who do you guys think did well? Who guys, you know, didn't do well? Huff, how do you think the Pens did? Things like that. I'm curious. Yeah, so Jesse, like you said, a lot of moves made at the deadline this year as we see a heavy Eastern Conference really gearing up a, an arms race really out there to see who can grab that Eastern Conference title. Um, I think some of the big the big spenders at the deadline, you saw the, the Bruins, the Maple Leafs, and the Rangers really make some dips into that trade realm, um, using a lot of assets, seeing a lot of first-round picks flying around as they try to get over the hump and get back to the Stanley Cup. Uh, I, I know that the, the Leafs added Ryan O'Reilly and a few defensemen. The Rangers got that big move with Kane, and then they got Tarasenko and some more depth. The Bruins adding a lot of pieces. 
Um, those are the teams I really look at out east. Mackie, if you had to if you had to give out a grade to some of those teams that I just talked about, where do you think they sit after those big moves? So with the actual moves, I'll go um, the Rangers with an A. Um, obviously, you're adding two players like Tarasenko and Kane. The just the um, experience these two guys have and what they bring to the table is tremendous. Um, Bruins, I'll go. B plus, A minus, whichever one. They're just adding pieces to a stacked roster. They didn't really need much. They just needed to add uh, just a little depth. And, you know, Orlov has been the absolute steal so far. Guy's playing out of his mind. So um, we got Bertuzzi recorded a point on his first night against the Rangers. Um, just They're just showing up right now. So uh, give them a B plus, A minus. Um, Leafs, all right. Leafs, I like, I like Ryan O'Reilly. It's a good piece to add to that team. I don't know. I just don't think that's what's going to put them over the edge. And every single year, they they seem to find uh, find themselves a little short. And is Ryan O'Reilly the answer? I know. I mean, I know. I know what you're going to say is the answer on St. Louis, but um, I don't know. We can see what this uh, Toronto team does with them. Yeah, you're you're not wrong. Ryan O'Reilly definitely brings some veteran experience to that roster. I know they added Gustafson on the back end, Jake McCabe, um, and a few others, uh, Noel Chari as well. But I'd probably put the, the Maple Leafs right there in that B range. I think they overspent to get some of those pieces. And O'Reilly already going down with an injury, a uh, broken finger, I believe. Tough to see right away off the bat. But they got to hope that that gets them over the hump. I still think that their goaltending woes will hold them back. And talking about the other ones, despite how Patrick Keane has underperformed so far, you have to give the Rangers an A with what they did. For the amount of, for the little amount they gave up to acquire Patrick Keane, potentially the best. American player of all time. I mean, that's insane. I think he's just going to show up in the playoffs and either have a, a crucial goal or a 10-point series and really stake his claim as a big piece of the Rangers. And then Tarasenko as well. I mean, you add those two scoring pieces, you're getting an A on his trade grade. Bruins um, took a lot of creativity to navigate around that tight salary cap as they were uh, very limited in what they could do. And they made moves at work. They got Bertuzzi, they got um, Orlov, and they got Hathaway. And I'm eager to see how they become cap compliant. Uh, right now, they have Taylor Hall on the IR, but they might pull a t- uh, Tampa Bay Lightning and um, try and eke that out to the playoffs. I'd, I'd still give them about an A grade. Bruins, Rangers, A. Give the Leafs a B. The only other team in the East that comes to mind at the deadline would be those New Jersey Devils adding Timo Meyer. I'm going to give them a B as well. I think this is, move will really help down the road. Um, teams like the Senators, you can give them a high grade as well. The Chitrin. Other than that, I don't think the Canes really needed to add much. I know they added some pieces, nothing notable. Um, they were already had that roster stacked. And then out east, I can't think of anybody else. I know the Pens added some depth pieces. Um, Horvat went to the Isles. Those things do jump out at you, but not worthy of an A grade. I'll give those Bs as well. And then, uh, Huff, you have anything to say about some of those moves that we just touched upon? Yeah, obviously, I didn't have too much to butt in on. Obviously, I kind of agreed with everything you said, Mackie, with the things about the Bruins and how they were already just kind of adding to a stack roster. Ace, you made that point uh, whenever they got Orlov and Bertuzzi and all those guys last week. Um, and then, obviously, like you said, Rangers, they get Patrick Kane, they get Vladimir Tarasenko, two proven cup winners and goal scorers that have done it for here and there all throughout the league. Um, you know, you got to give them the props where props are due. Like you said, they haven't uh, necessarily – had the success on the ice since getting there. Uh, mostly in Patrick Kane's case, I know uh, he hasn't had the hottest start in um, New York, but obviously anytime you have a three-time Stanley Cup winner and you can get him for a second and fourth round pick, I think you're going to go ahead and do that. And uh, the Rangers went out and did it. Credit to them. Obviously, we've been hearing about this trade for a couple of months, and uh, they finally went out and they said, okay, let's just do this. Let's go all in this year and figure this out. We have the team to do it. Um, I think we're gearing up for a great NHL playoffs. Uh, a lot of these teams made good moves. Uh, the Penguins are cut, took a page out of the Pirates book, bringing back Nick Menino and thinking that was going to solve all the problems, bringing back the guy that everyone loved a couple of years ago, going to get a couple people back in the stands wearing his jersey. Uh, it, it's not what we needed. I, I, good player, good player for the fourth line, but Nick Benino is not going to be the difference between uh, – a six game first round exit and you know making a making a Stanley Cup run in my opinion but I don't know I, I I'm interested to see how Granlin catches on with the Penguins but not other than that no no two huge of moves we get Kulikov off the Ducks but we needed a, a defenseman I've been saying that a left-handed defenseman so we went out and got that of one of the a little tougher kind of play style which I like but Granlin, Benino, uh, I would have liked, like I said last week, a JT Miller, a Brock Besser, uh, even a Jacob Shikrin. But, you know, 
I just keep living in fantasy land over here. I guess Ron Hextall sees something I don't in this team and has more faith than I do right now. But um, after, I mean, that performance yesterday, Tristan Jari gives up four early to the three in the first period of the Blue Jackets, one early to start the second, and the Penguins rally back and win. We had a minus one and a half. I really had faith they were going to cover that minus one and a half with an empty net. Um, but obviously they couldn't get one uh, in the third, and they went to overtime and won the game. But um, to rally back from down 4 nothing, obviously it's against Columbus, so you take that with a grain of salt, but um, not necessarily one of the best teams in the NHL. But they've they've been playing well. I think they're still going to be one of those bubble teams that we're talking about later on in the in the season as, as it comes to an end and we get down to the NHL playoffs. But uh, my trust in Tristan Jari is starting to fade and fade away, but uh, not addressing the problems that we had at this trade deadline. I, I, I would give the I'll, – I'll be the harsh one at the Penguins. I'll give them maybe a C, C-, minus, like – you need a goal. You needed a goal scorer and a talented defenseman. You went and got a hitting defenseman and a fourth line center. Um, I just I think there could have been more done. The Bruins didn't need people, and they went and got a goal scoring defenseman and a fourth line tough motherfucker that's gonna be, probably score goals for them in the playoffs because he's gonna get the chances. So um, I don't know. Like I said, maybe they see something I don't. That's just my rant. Yeah, about the Penguins. I've been waiting to get that off my chest. <laughs> deservedly so i've been in those deadlines before where it seems like we didn't do too much but i think it's going to take more than one member of that hbk line to come back and bring you guys to the glory days i said uh, i literally said that i go just what we need i go what's next phil kessel's coming back too like yeah yeah i mean really they're, they're diving into the past it's not gonna get them much further than it has in recent memory but you you talked about those blue jackets they've really been killers on our uh, daily card killing those puck lines so we're definitely gonna lock it and look at that a bit more keep Stay away from them, even though they they seem lowly on the on the sports betting sites. You, you they're half the still they're half NHL the reason team. we've we've taken this dip in the NHL. They are yeah, literally like sixty percent of the reason that we've taken this dip. And I was still on that Penguins one, and we still wrote it. But we're gonna be looking into those numbers a bit more. I know Mackie and Hopper big stat guys. Jesse's great at pulling those for us too. So we'll we'll bounce back for sure. Um, yeah, we one just, more thing about those Blue Jackets to say. They were involved in a very crazy deal that saw we talked about last week, seeing Jonathan Quick go to their team but never actually suiting up. Um, since last week, though, he's actually been dealt to the Vegas Golden Knights in what I think is one of the crazier moves out west at the deadline. I know they added um, Barbashev from St. Louis has really turned it up playing with Eichel and Marcia so, but Quick is going to be interesting to see. Come down the stretch in the playoffs for a Vegas Golden Knights team that can't get over the hump. I mean, two-time Stanley Cup champion, that'll help. Um, that's got to be one of my favorite moves of the deadline. Other than that, I like or out west. I also liked how the LA Kings added Corpusalo as they look towards their playoff run. That'll be a good piece. And furthermore, um, the last one I want to touch on is those Dallas Stars. You see those on our card almost night in and night out. And they had a big move with Max Domi, who seems to bounce around team and year in, year out. I mean, he produces those, so that'll be another piece for a high-octane team in Dallas out west. I know Max has got some thoughts on these western trade deadline acquisitions as well. Yeah, Domi to, uh, Domi to Dallas is nice. He actually netted one the other night for us. We we ended up losing out right anyway, but it was still nice to uh, see his impact right away. Um, question about Quick in Vegas. Do you think he's going to start in the playoffs? I don't think so, but at the same time, you have these young guys, right, or inexperienced starters going into the playoffs. If they falter early, I would think that there's a quick change to Jonathan Quick, and if he catches Short any type leash. of success... Yeah, no pun if he intended. catches any type of success, they'll ride Jonathan Quick until that flame dies, I think. Yeah, I think the main thing about him, grabbing him right now is uh, the fact that they have two injured goalies right now, and they're playing Aiden Hill every single night. But, um, mm-hmm. yeah, you're definitely right about the veteran experience. He's, he's been there before. He knows what it feels like. And, you know, you got Logan Thompson, who's a rookie. He goes out there and gives up four and, a, or four and two straight games or a few quick ones. And, you know, you got to pull that. Get, get, uh, get the veteran experience out there. Yeah, I really like that kid Logan Thompson. I hope I hope he's able to get back so he can have the uh, the net for the playoffs for them. I really think he's a good goalie. Yeah, he is. I know really that, good, but uh, I know Jesse's going to get into the awards here shortly. But Logan Thompson agreed, great goalie. I was hoping he was stuck around in that Rookie of the Year race, but injury kind of held him back after a great campaign. Did wasn't he in like Vesna talks too early on? Yeah, early on. I'd say early. First it half. never meant anything really because it was so early, but yeah. And then Allmark went on that. The Bruins and Allmark went on that streak, and it just was never a question. Dude, what are Allmark's odds at this point? They got to be like minus 600, 700. We'll, we'll review them. I have that here. Yeah, we've got them coming up. Didn't know we had it coming up. Got it. Mac, UNLV Cash, Seton Hall up six. 
Nah, three. DePaul just banged a three. Oh, really? You're ahead yeah. of me. Well, we had a, I'd say we had a very successful trade deadline. Uh, you know, lots to look forward to there. Lots to uh, analyze and take care of. So we'll see how these teams fare come into the playoffs. Real excited about that. Next point I got here is Connor McDavid. Connor McDavid currently sitting at 124 points. He needs just 26 points in 17 games, I believe, to reach 150 points on the season. What do we think? Do we think he'll uh, accomplish this feat? Yeah, real quick. Earlier, about two or three weeks ago, we had this conversation. I said he's going to get 150, and you guys are like, no way. He's put up like 23 points in the last 10 games. It's been unbelievable. But, um, yeah, he's going to get this. I mean, he's averaging almost over two points per game at this point. I mean, he doesn't even need that to get this, and he's just been on a tear. You, it's nothing you can do to stop him. It's two goals every single night. If it's not two goals, it's two assists. Um, yeah, it's all. I mean, he's just he's easily getting this. Yeah, you're right. The thing is, Huff and I were against it. I mean, not no discredit to Conor McDavid. This is just something we haven't seen in our lifetime. Yeah, right. True. It's, it's, <laughs> yeah, it's okay. crazy. <laughs> Mackie, you're right. Like, we should have seen this coming. He's the best talent we've ever seen step on the ice. But, like, it's so crazy to think that that's even possible in this NHL, especially since the rest of the league is so good. But here he is doing it, and he's going to accomplish that feat. Happy I have his MVP ticket sitting in my pocket. In this talented of a league, it's incredible what he's doing. He's got to score 70 goals, dude. He's never scored 50 goals in the season. I didn't know that until he got it. But he's already at 54, and he has, like, what, like 17 games left? You said he's going to score 70. Yeah. He's never scored 50. Fun to watch. No, that was his first 50 goal season. Isn't that crazy? Yeah. He's Big never been Apple a goal guy. scorer. He's never been a goal scorer. All right, good stuff. Hey, Let's jump yeah, into some of these. I mean, he's definitely okay. going to get it. All right, good stuff. Let's jump into some of these uh, awards odds that we got going on for this season. The Calder, the Norris, Vesna, the Hart, all that junk. Uh, Ace, do you want to spearhead this one? Yeah, definitely. Um, Mac was alluding to it earlier, and I know we kind of touched on this at the halfway point and then early on in the season. Um, hopefully you listened to our talks earlier because a lot of these picks that we had have came true. Um, these are the current odds where we're sitting right now. A lot of these are locks. If uh, if you can, go on to your website, see if you can parlay some long shot odds. Definitely not a bad thing to have. Our partners at Bet in the U.S. have helped me out. They're definitely sitting on three of my tickets that are looking to cash with heavy favorites. Um, I put that in months ago, I think right when our partnership started. I had that McDavid um, MVP sitting at minus 275 money line, which seems steep. But now coming into today, that Hart Trophy uh, odds, Connor McDavid sitting at minus 4,000. So I, I'm pretty happy sitting with that minus 275 ticket. Um, Pasternak just behind him at the plus 3,100. That award is about, just about <laughs> locked up. Um, Sitting right behind him at plus 3,100. <laughs> yeah, crazy to say. Um, I think he's got a better chance of catching him in those odds than he does in catching him in the real points race, right? But moving on, another one that we, we touched on early. Um, you guys remember who we had as our rookie of the year pick coming in? Um, let me guess. No, I don't think I had Veneers. It, um, me and Huff, it, what, our, our group consensus was Beniers, who's currently sitting at the leader with minus 370. Next up with Mason McTavish at plus 800. So I, I grabbed that when we said it at plus 140 um, early in the season. Hopefully you guys jumped on as Beniers is uh, above 50 points on the campaign, leading his team to the playoffs. So he should be able to finish up with that minus 370 odds. Um, moving across the board, um, the Vesna Trophy, that's that's all but locked up. We, we said this a while ago, too, with Olmark. He's sitting... Just about the same odds as uh, Ben Yers at minus 350 to win that Vesna as long as, yeah. I have minus 700 for Olmark and minus 600 for Ben Yers. Wow, you have the more updated minus, one, I'd Minus say. 700 this, makes sense for Olmark. Minus 350 yeah. is a steal right now. Oh, I, this is literally four days ago. That's why. March 4th. Wow. They've, um, One of the crazier ones to look at is uh, that Norris Trophy. Um, Coming into the year, you definitely would have thought that you have heard names like McCarr, Hedman, or Fox, or even McAvoy in that conversation. Heisman comes to my mind, too. Um, But it's Eric Carlson sitting at the leader with minus 230. Um, Adam Fox just behind. Any any surprise by that? I mean, this season's been pretty nasty this year out in San Jose, kind of lost with all their uh, losing games. 
It was also like three overtime winners in the span uh, in that span. It was just he was like had, he had an insane start to the season and, and he hasn't done anything to lose the spot. So I mean he's it's just carrying over. He's still edging out Fox for a little. I, I think he deserves it. Even being a Rangers fan, I mean guys old as dirt and he's like getting wins. He's getting a. He, I don't even know. I guess he's not not even really getting wins, but he's he's carrying that Sharks team to be at least decent. Um, he's doing his uh, he's doing his job with no help really on a team that has no incentive to win playing out out west in San Jose. I mean, kudos to him for showing up. Definitely love to see it. One of my favorite players to watch. I know long time listener. We shot him out a lot. Addison Collins. That's his boy out there in San Jose now. So love to see that for the boy. Um, and then the final final odds I'd like to touch on uh, the Jack Adams Award, the coaching one. Um, obviously it's gonna come down to that Bruins team breaking all these records. So it's going to end up probably going to Jim Montgomery. The odds really leaning that way as well. But some of the other notable coaches that are having good seasons, um, I got it right here. There it is. Lindy Ruff with the Devils. I mean, if the Bruins aren't doing what they're doing, that's a lock any other year. That's crazy. I mean, and Rob Brendamore, great coach, year in and year out. He built that team. He's sitting right behind him and Dave Hacksaw with the crack and as they look to make their first appearance in postseason history. But Jim Montgomery sitting at a minus 350 right now. So if you can somehow go into some of your books, I know BetUS, I think you were able to do it and you can parlay some of those odds for uh, future awards. I, I'd look at something like Jimmy Montgomery and Linus Allmark at that Bruins combo. Maybe you get the uh, Veneers and Allmark. There's some, some guys that should be taking them home. We've been saying it all year and now they're really looking to hone in with some hefty odds. So. If you have a chance to do something like that, I'd be I'd be looking. In my opinion, I think the Bruins could lose every single game the rest of the season, and Jim Montgomery should still win Coach of the Year. Yeah, it's crazy. I mean, I remember when we were younger, we'd be fighting over triple digits, and now we have it with like so many games to go. Yeah, I mean, it's ridiculous, especially coming in first year. Yep, yep, love to see it. Uh, way to be, boys, but. A lot of those odds, definitely, that's why you got to ride with us and tune in week in and week out. We give you these updates on um, some of these awards, and they turn out to ring true most of the time. The four of us uh, dig deep into this research, so want to make sure we give our, our listeners valued picks. Love when we can come down the line and say that the picks were good from the beginning. So can't complain about that. Last point we got here in the NHL, boys. Quinn Hughes became the fastest defenseman in NHL history to reach 200 career assists. He did it in just 263 games played, beating Brian Leach, who reached the milestone in just 264 games. So beat him by just one game. Ace, you want to comment? What do you think? Yeah, just a a quick note on this. Kind of like we were saying with Eric Carlson. I mean, another guy just going to work day in and day out on a team that's really throwing in the towel, trading away their pieces and nowhere near the playoffs. Even in his young career, you hear his overshadowed by his brother Jack and having the success they have in New Jersey. So kudos to Quinn Hughes and eager to watch the rest of his career unfold. I saw this. And when I saw this in here, I was pretty impressed by this. I didn't really, again, I don't watch too many Vancouver Canucks games. So um, I guess I didn't realize the kind of pace he's been at throughout his career. So. Uh, props to him. Definitely don't think about him whenever you think of like a top, you know, offensive defenseman in the NHL, in my opinion. But uh, clearly has consistent uh, shown consistency over you know his whole career. So um, you know, obviously his brother's having a hell of a year in New Jersey, and he's kind of silently having another good year up in Vancouver. So, but other than that, I I was pretty shocked to see that. This family breeds talent. Yeah. I mean, we know what kind of, what kind of talent he has up there in Vancouver. Um, he's a little overshadowed by his brother nowadays, but he's still got all the talent in the world. They have a third brother too, about to be drafted, no? Yeah, he's at Michigan. Lights it up. Yeah. Luke, Luke Hughes, Luke Hughes. They should all go to the Devils. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see all three of them uh, take the ice one time. Hopefully, kind of like the stalls, their second, their second round of. Uh, yeah, well, Luke was drafted to the Devils, so they will, they will, he will be on that that uh, roster in the next few years. That'd, that'd be cool. Quinn Hughes has to want out of Vancouver soon, right? I mean, he'll definitely get yeah. the bag there. 
I mean, you're, you're, you're shipping um, Horvat like that. You know, you got to see a rebuild coming soon, right? I mean, you still have, obviously, the pieces. You have Besser. You have Elias Pedersen there. Um, they still have some pieces there that know how to know what they're doing. But I just don't see a, a, anything building there. Maybe you get to the playoffs. But, you know, they're never going to get back to when they had, like, Luongo and the Sedins and that team was they do have a that. They do have a lot of talent, though, like you said, with Pedersen. And they, did you guys see the deadline move they kind of did under the radar? They grabbed uh, Phil Peronic from the Detroit Red Wings. I was surprised that he was dealt. That's a good ad, in my opinion, a right-handed D-man to play alongside Quinn Hughes. And they, they grabbed Beauvillier in return for Horvat, who's 25 years old and kind of having some success right away. And then Demko, who's been hurt all season, had a career year last year. They're, they're looking for future success, and I think they have some assets and some youth and come about kind of like the Kraken did this year. Yeah, I, I, I always a, forget that, that is a good Beauvillier point. went there in that deal. Beauvillier is a nice piece. He's, he's a good hockey player. They definitely have pieces. It's just... I. I the recent recency bias pieces. on them. Yeah, they've always had someone, I feel like, and they just can't get it done. I don't know. And now, obviously, out west, you have, you know, the Oilers and the Avalanche and, like, the Stars have come along. So I just – I don't see them being one of these powerhouses, but um, I don't know. I, I, I would like to see Quinn Hughes uh, move on, and I'd like to see him go to Jersey, even though that's an Eastern Conference, but I think that would be cool to see him play with his brothers. Good stuff, boys. Lots of good stuff here out of the NHL. You know, picks daily. Uh, we got to be better on that NHL card, but lots to look forward to as the playoffs approach. Let's jump into some NBA. The first one, first point I got here is that Colorado police are investigating John Morant after an Instagram live video of him flashing a gun in a club became public. Jaw has been away from the team since. Uh, I believe we found out some more information on this. Huff, do you know anything else on this? Yeah, they've closed their investigation uh, due to a lack of available evidence in the situation. Basically, the only thing they had was the video, from what I understand. But um, obviously, John Morant's been all over all over the news and everything with this. And we've even seen like Plexico Burris make a statement saying, "If you haven't learned from me, uh, you know, learn from. If you haven't learned from me, learn by me, or something." I don't know. He said some weird ass quote about it, but um, obviously. Uh, ever since John Morant said he's fine in the West, things have not been fine in the West for the Grizzlies. They have not been he good on the really, road. He really messed himself up with that one, I swear. Yeah, they, I mean, ever since then, the West got loaded up with players. The Grizzlies' road record has been atrocious, and obviously it's due to the the partying on the road that this team is doing that we saw them blow a lead the other the night young the Clippers. Team. You and, know how they are. Oh, yeah, too, and it's like, I mean, apparently this all happened after Steven Adams held a player only meeting saying like, Hey, we got to buckle down when we're on the road. Like we can't be going out all the time. Like we got to win these road games. These are vital road games coming down to the end of the season. And then boom, John Morant flashes a gun in a club. And this makes the news. If I'm, if I'm John Morant, I know I'm the face of that team, but I'm definitely, I'd be scared of Steven Adams. He's definitely an intimidating motherfucker. Yeah, I mean, he's one of the faces of the league, at, one of the young faces of the league at this point. Um, obviously, you don't want to lose a player like that. People get, people are saying he'll be out 50 games, and he'll end the season right there. Um, I don't know. He's just being... He, really I, think he, I think he is going to get a suspension. It just depends how long. I don't think it'll be anywhere near that. I thought, like, a couple I, games. That was yeah, like what that, everyone was saying, 50 games. Yeah, that was if it was on team premises and it wasn't. It was at the nightclub. And they dropped the charges against him, if you guys saw that today. <clears throat> yeah, I did see that. Yeah. The big thing is it's he's he's a future face of the NBA, right? Or at least wants to be. And you can't be doing things like that. He's I saw the quote that said he's going to be the first one that's going to make it into the hood by going into the NBA, not making it out. <laughs> so that was Jalen Rose, I think, uh, had some comments on that. Going the wrong way there, bud. <laughs> that's funny. Yeah. So the tough thing is with that Grizzlies team that keeps looking to make that next step and be a – legitimate contender in the west i mean distractions like this with your best player are not the best thing with playoffs just around the corner so <clears throat> i'd see them as an easy one and done come playoffs even if yep. everybody's back and playing and then that i'm no nah, i'm fine in the west there's gonna be a meme forever yep and the kevin grizzlies durant are just grizzlies are just consistently memed 
the, the, the door is wide open. The door is wide open for this Kevin Durant team to, to swoop right in and grab a ring. But I think we cashed on the uh, Lakers last night on a jawless Grizzlies, right? Yeah, against them. Grizzlies did not look good down the stretch at all. Jaron Jackson just carries that team. He was in foul trouble today. He was on the bench a lot, but I don't know. That team has they just look down in the dumps. Yeah, yeah we'll tough to spot for them. That. As Morant, they're, as Morant's situation unfolds, we'll have to see and maybe keep betting against them. They're definitely not fine in the West. I'd say that. All right, the next point in the NBA. Emmanuel quickly drops a career high 38 points in 55 minutes in a t- second overtime win against the one seeded Boston Celtics in Boston on Sunday night, just one night before WWE Monday Night Raw took over the building, took over TD Garden. This is the ninth straight win for the New York Knicks as they currently sit as the five seed in the East. Uh, hey, so what do we think about the Knicks come playoff time? They a scary team. Mackie, your New York Knicks. Yeah, they actually dropped one last night to the Hornets. I this is a headline from a few days ago, but um, I don't. This Knicks team is kind of scary. I mean, obviously you have the top three teams in the East, and you 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 categorize them ahead, of, and then you have like the Cavs and the Knicks and all of them. But um, I mean, this team's won nine straight. They have shooters everywhere. Jalen Brunson is the best offseason pickup of all time. I swear, the guy's out of control. Um, they won nine straight. Manuel quickly is playing some of the best basketball we've seen out of out of a Knicks point guard in forever. Um I just think that they could definitely be a sleeper team. You if they run into like the six say they say they play the Sixers in the first or in the second round, they could definitely beat the Sixers team. I wouldn't really match them up against the Celtics or the Bucks. I think they'd get too oversized by the by the Bucks and there's just the shooters on on Boston would just take over in a seven game series. But I think this team is definitely like not someone you're gonna push over. Um they have a lot of assets, a lot of key pieces on that team that can that could definitely win a few playoff series. Yeah, Mac, you're you're right. It's kind of nice to see the Knicks really have everything falling into place after a few recent few years of a lot of youth and um, going through the growing pains and whatnot. But uh, they, they're really starting to come together, and they emphasize that with a road win and double overtime. Uh, you could see the way they celebrated that that was a big one for them, and hopefully that success carries on to the playoff run. Um, I do think they could give someone a scare down the stretch, take out a top team, not necessarily, but they do have a lot of depth and a lot of scores there. So a lot of, a lot of good things for years to come out of New York. Uh, Celtics, on the other hand, tough beat on that game, especially those who bet that one. Um, like Jalen Brown said, I think they lost another tight one last night in overtime. And Jalen Brown said, it doesn't matter about playing well. We're, we're here to win games. So that's nice to hear the top team, not just be content with uh, taking a loss and, in the regular season, even though they have a lot more to play for down the stretch, uh, being ready to go night in and night out. And we got Tatum back tonight as well, so eager to watch that one. Yeah, and obviously that being both of your guys' uh, technical teams in the NBA, me not having really a stake in that, uh, I didn't even have a bet on that game, and I was just watching it, and that was a crazy, one of the better NBA games I've watched over the past couple of weeks. And I know we had that Phoenix-Dallas game on, I believe it was Saturday or Sunday this past weekend, but... That that Celtics Knicks game that was a great game, Mackie, and I'm right there with you. That kind of showed me that this Knicks team is definitely not going to be an easy out for someone, especially like a Celtics or um, if they get matched up against maybe a, another team gets upset and they get a easier team maybe in the second round. Who knows? But um, I, I definitely think that Knicks team's here to make some noise. But obviously, we know what the Celtics, Bucks, Sixers—they're all capable of, and there's their expectations going into the playoffs. But I don't think many people have expectations for these Knicks, and you can still get good value on them a lot. And um, I think they're a good team right now. Obviously, streaking. You said nine and one in their past ten, so um, they've been they've been rolling. Yeah, and Emmanuel quickly is becoming one of the better point guards of the league. Obviously, you still have your uh, your elite um, Damian Lillard, Luka Doncic, Steph Curry, those guys. But he's definitely right there with like Trey Young. Um, just some of the young guys, some of the young point guards Fox. in the league that are trying to, yeah, Fox is trying to establish themselves in that top tier. He's right there, um, and he's really showing it this this season. I wish you guys would have got Donovan Mitchell. I wish you. Got, I like Terry's caliber, and I think he's a good stud. He's guard. a nice piece. He goes under the radar a lot, but I do wish we got Donovan Mitchell. And he's from Elmsbury. He's from 15 minutes from my house. Like just that was trade home. though, right? That was what? trade, not for agent. That was trade. Donovan Mitchell to, yeah, that, to the Cavs. That was a trade. That sent Sexton it was a to trade. Utah. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, Knicks could have done something. 
Yeah, no, agreed. But I think they like the group they have, and they'll have it for years to come. All right, that'll, that'll do it this week uh, for me. Definitely uh, hyped to be talking some sports with the boys. Like we've been saying all night, going to get that NHL and NBA card back up and rolling. Um, looking forward to that and looking forward to this March Madness and the contest to come. So definitely stay tapped into the socials for these giveaways that are uh, upcoming and our picks, and we'll get you that green. All right, Ace, thanks. We'll see you here uh, next week. All right, that's just going to about wrap up what we got going on here in the NBA. Let's jump to a little uh, little golf. We got the players coming on this weekend, and now we welcome for the first time to the podcast our buddy Sam Kostelik, who's going to give us a good rundown on some golf. Like I said, players this weekend, the Masters coming up soon. So let's turn it over to Sam to see what you got. Take it away, Sam. You're fine. All right, go ahead, Sam. Yeah, so uh, starting off talking about a little bit of golf. Um, obviously, we got the players this week, but I want to start off first. Question on everyone's mind when it comes to golf. What's everyone think about Liv? How are we feeling about that? What do we know? What don't we know? Everything. Yes, I want to know what you know. And you, Mackie, obviously, but, but I want to hear what everyone wants to say. Go ahead, Mackie. I'm sorry. I just don't understand how they're able to come back and play in PGA events. Like, if you're getting paid these hundreds of millions of dollars by these Saudi Arabian guys in the LIV, why can you just come back and play PGA and get paid from PGA, too? I... Yeah, I don't know. That's the thing. I don't know. I think uh, I think, I think, think that's the thing with, with tournaments like the Masters and tournaments like, you know, the U.S. Open, stuff like that. Those aren't. I mean, I don't know the, the calling on it, but I know those aren't like like everyday run of the mill PGA tour events. So I'm whoever if you've won the Masters, if you've won the US Open, any of these majors, I think they should follow that format where they say if you're if you won, you should come back. No matter what you could play in, on a PGA tour event in my backyard, I don't care. It it shouldn't matter. You should be able to play if you've won. Now Just the tricky the part is got yeah, yeah, hundred percent. Hundred Phil Mickelson, and you know what? They golf is at a display at a spot right now where they shouldn't be denying people, especially people like Dustin Johnson, people like Phil Mickelson, stuff like that. It shouldn't matter what's going on. They should not be denying them the reason to come play golf. I only say, what do you think? What do you think about Liv? Because I personally love it. I think. The PGA, similarly to the MLB, is run by a bunch of 65, 7 year old white guys who are so out of touch with, you know, what might be going on in the world or what might be going on in sports and stuff like that. And that's holding it's holding the sport back. You've seen I mean, why why do you think golf is just now, you know, getting into the limelight? It's because of stuff like that that last swing Netflix documentary or the live tour doing cool shit every week. Like I don't know. People don't want to. People don't want to see. You know, as stupid as it sounds, no one. No one's tuning in to watch. I. I. I'd be lying if I said I'm tuning in for every hour of every shot of every of every match because I'm watching yeah. a good a good majority I mean, of the time. I ba- I barely watch anything Thursdays. It's never. Yeah, I mean, Thursdays. as like I mean, I'm not a big golf guy, so I can't say I'm an avid golf fan. But I basically only watch on Sundays when like the yeah when it matters most. But but I will say the reason you're you're seeing it more on TikTok or you're hearing about it more on social media and stuff like that, it's because of the stuff like the live where, you know, they're making golf fun again. I, I don't know, like live live does a pretty cool format where they have teams. I I can't I can't recite off the top of my head how the teaming works, but but pretty basically, like I was looking at it today and and they got guys like Bryson DeChambeau who's a captain, Brooks Kepka Brooks Kepka is a captain. I think that's a lot cooler of a way to learn about more golfers as compared to you got to tune in on Sunday or tune in on, on Saturday and sit there and say, Hey, okay, this guy who, you know, I've never seen before. He might be in the lead. And then you never see him again. Like, uh, hurt Kitty this weekend. I don't, you may never see him talk to the leaderboard ever again, just because, I mean, he's a great golfer, but there's, it's, I'll lead into my next point about who's going to win this weekend, but guys like Scotty Scheffler, guys like John Ram, guys like Max Homa, 
those are the big names that like Liv was able to go out and get with Mickelson and DeChambeau and Kepka. And I don't know. I just think they're doing it right. I think uh, I'm pretty excited because they just got a TV deal. So they weren't showing, they weren't showing their matches on TV um, up until like, I, I don't know if it started yet or what, but it's starting pretty soon. I'm excited to watch it. I think it'll be cool. I think it'll be a lot more fun of a broadcast. They got a lot more personalities on there. So we'll see how that goes. But, uh, but I'm sorry to take it up. Jesse, how do you have any thoughts on Liv? No, but I, I do have something I want to say, so I'm happy you sent it to me. But I think it's interesting because from a production side that I understand, you know, it's going to make things more competitive and competition in a lot of ways is good, um, especially with a powerhouse like the PGA that owns the industry essentially, right? There's no other name in golf that anybody can think of. I can guarantee that. Um, and yeah. now with Liv being there, it's going to – cause them to be more creative and things like that so i mean that's what we see in the nhl tnt came in they're starting to be more creative getting biz and you know wayne and all those guys out there that's making they're setting the bar a little higher so like espn's coming in and they're dropping the ball their broadcasts suck i mean a yeah, lot of times but- it's the local ones i get it which is good that the local people are getting exposure but anytime that espn like does the stuff or whatever it's a whole mess right talks about the nhl anything yeah like that. I- that's its own fucking thing i mean I, I think I, I like to compare uh, – what I like to compare Liv to is it's almost like if the XFL was, like, worth watching. That's what it feels like. I feel Cause, that. Because it, fe- it feels like they have that fun, but they that's also – That's a really good comparison. Yeah. It's not really, that, I mean, That's a really good comparison in the sense that it's something that is new and you're not used to, and but in the sense that the XFL doesn't have the money to go out and get a, a Josh Allen when to pay him $150 yeah. million, dollars, but – what I was going to say about the live, and the one thing that I think is interesting is uh, from a PGA standpoint, I think it's actually added value to the PGA. A lot of people saying like the, in, in the sense of, oh, if you're not going to sign for this, what are you going to do? Go play for the live. And like, that's what the, for the past 40 years, it's been, oh, what are you, where are you going to go play golf? Where are you going to go play golf? And now with this whole live tour and like, at least how it started, it's been kind of like, a, oh, you're going to play for them kind of idea. And like, you know, you're going to join the Saudis and all the kind of money and you're taking all the money to go play wherever. But I, I, the fact that they're still allowed to play in the majors, I think that's definitely a plus for them. But I think the the part of the PGA Tour kind of adding value to themselves is I think this just put more eyes on the PGA Tour, at least like, like you said, whether it's the startup of Live and that is what got more eyes on golf in general and it wasn't on TV. So it immediately guys like, you know, the average golf fan that's tuning in to watch a live golf event and they're like, oh shit, it's Sunday afternoon. This live event isn't on cable. Uh, I guess I might as well watch, you know, the Genesis invitation or, you know what I mean? Any of these yeah. other PGA events that are just on your average en- or your average weekend on a Sunday afternoon. And I mean, you look at some of these majors, like obviously we have the players this weekend, the masters coming up. And I think obviously there's a reason that live players are coming back to the PGA for these majors. And it's still going to be the king, kind of like you said with the XFL and the NFL. The NFL will always be king no matter how much money the XFL ever gets. But I, I do think the PGA is still in a good spot. I think they do need to do things to grow the game and enhance it to a younger audience. But um, I think from a live standpoint, I think that, like you said, they started, they did it right. I mean, right in the sense that they just went out and got a bunch of big names that people want to see, a Dustin Johnson, a Phil Mickelson, a Brooks Kepka. You know, they went out and – basically signed both of the the Brooks and uh, DeChambeau rivalry, that kind of rivalry they had cooking, and went and got both of those guys so they would kind of have a storybook uh, kind of rivalry to start their season. I know I kept using that term, but that's exactly kind of what they wanted. They wanted a storyline to start the to start the PG or start the live event, I guess, you know, right, uh, kind of something to put your eyes on the TV, but back to the PGA. I think it's I think it's all good with them. I think obviously we've seen some of the numbers on their majors over the past couple of years have slipped, but obviously you're still going to get eyes on the Masters and all these other big major events. Now, okay. Two two points to that. Um the first point, I think it's funny you say like how like, you know, you can kind of compare PGA and what Did you I don't know if you guys saw it. Live Golf tweeted the other day about how Pete the PGA came out with a bunch of, I'm just reading up on it right now. And they're going to, they're going to have a bunch of events that are no cut events, which is similar to what Liv's doing. 
Um, and they're also increasing their prize purse again. So they live golf tweeted back at it and they said, imitation is the greatest form of flattery. Congratulations, congratulations, PGA. Welcome to the future. I thought that was hilarious, but I, I, this is going to lead me into my next point about someone who I don't care for particularly lately. Rory McIlroy has been really outspoken about fuck, fuck this, fuck that, you know, live, you know, he's MF and all these, all these live guys. He's the one who's out here also pushing for these no cut events, stuff like that. I personally think, I mean, this is just stupid off the top of my head, but I think Rory McIlroy just didn't get a live deal and he's just pissed about that. But also, <laughs> I I think that um, I don't know. I think that I, I the second point I want to bring up is what do you think with live growing and you know probably making more money? How do we think more and more players are going to transition from the PGA Tour over there? And do you think it'll happen? I mean, do you think do we think they can get another big name? I don't know. I think it, if this TV deal goes well, yeah. You know, because they I'm want exposure to too. The There's more than just the, you know, their name. They want to build up their name more than just you know what they do on the golf course. Mm-hmm. I, I think I think P, the PGA kind of still has the golf world in that chokehold where it's like, okay, well you can take if you go out and take John Rom, they'll they'll find some new kid who's a little bit lower in the world ranking. He'll shoot up. Next thing you know, he's the next star. And and I think I don't know the PGA just does a good job at replacing their stars. But I mean, we saw that. That that leads me to my next point, which I mean, this is just kind of off the top of my head too, kind of a good segue. But um, who do we think from the live can pose a threat on uh, April, whenever that is in Augusta? Who do we think is going to do it? Because you know, one of those live guys is going to make a run. It, it's I'm checking my notes. I got Dustin Johnson and Cam Smith. Dustin Johnson at the ma- at the Masters is going to be a top ten. I love to play him at five, but I don't know. Top five betting's tough, especially in the PGA. But he's a, he's going to be top ten. I there's no doubt in my mind about that because that guy has been shit on from everyone in the PGA. Rory McIlroy up and down about what he did for his money, which is no one else's fucking business to begin with. I don't know if you guys watch the watch watch Full Swing on Netflix if you haven't already. It's it's a pretty cool look inside what um what they're doing in the golf world but you know everyone's shitting on them this and that you know i i've made i made it clear before i'll make it clear again the live golf tour is an opportunity for golfers to do what they want the dustin johnson said this they could do it less and they make more money i do the same fucking thing i mean i don't know why anyone else wouldn't but whatever i think dustin johnson do just purely off of the fact that you know he's out of the limelight a little bit while he's on live hasn't been seen by the pga that much he's gonna want to shine at augusta and he's gonna do it i mean he's he's, he might still be the best golfer in the world but you know i I, the the index doesn't work like that where you know they don't rank you whatever stupid shit but i still think dustin johnson can i think dustin johnson is really gonna fire on the same hand from a from a guy who wants to be that PGA stud and, and show off Rory McIlroy, also top 10 on, uh, on Sunday at, at, at the Masters. I mean, they're just, those two are the, if anything, they're both the face of their respective league. So Rory's going to be the guy who wants to show off for the PGA and Dustin's going to be the guy who wants to show off for the lift. It's that simple. Not that hard. It's golf. It's emotional. Everything about that game is fucking emotional. And whenever you want to win more, like guys like Dustin Johnson, guys like Rory Macro, whenever they want to win more, they're going to be in that mix. That's, I mean, I don't know. That's just, that's, that's the end of it. And that's looking way ahead at the Masters. My bet is going to change. I still think those two guys are going to stay in, but I'm going to add a lot more. I want to see, you know, let's get into the players a little bit here. The, what a weekend we got ahead of us here. We're, I, the Players Championship, I want to say, yeah, so Players Championship, they're playing it this weekend. Where the hell? Oh, they're playing it at Sawgrass too? Jeez, I did not. They always play it at Sawgrass though, don't they? Am I wrong? I have no uh, idea. Yeah, whatever. 
what a weekend. TPC Sawgrass. I, oh, I'm fucking thrilled. I think 17 is going to be a blast all weekend. I think if you have a chance to go to the event, you're going to have a blast. I, is this, this is the fifth major, right? I, does anyone else know that one? I think this is the fifth major. I'm Wait, sure. where is this? This one's at Sawgrass. Oh, it is. TPC Sawgrass. Yeah, this is at TPC Sawgrass. You got probably the best hole in golf with the 17th hole. Definitely the this best hole in golf. Yeah, easily the best hole in golf. I'll get a little off topic again here. Going back to Liv, uh, before we get fully into, into majors, Liv, one more thing I saw with Liv. I don't know if anyone's seen it, but it might. It must be an event coming up, something like that. They built a um, a 16th hole similarly to what they have for the Waste Management Open. That stadium hole? You know what I'm talking about? Yeah. Yeah, I know what you're talking. The 16th at the uh, West like Man- Waste Management or whatever it is. I'm talking to picture. me. Sorry, what'd you say? I'm talking to whoever. I'm talking to whoever wants to listen to me. PPC Sawgrass say? Stadium. I said so. Um, I said going back to live real quick. Yeah, 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 yeah. So going back to lives. Uh, 16th at Waste Management, whatever it is. They just built um, that like stadium esque hole. Where everyone's going nuts and throwing beers and shit, they just built one like that for the live course they're playing this week. That's like the best so, thing they could do for golf. Yeah, I, have you you've seen that? You've seen that hole, right, Mackie? Yeah, hundred percent. People go crazy. I okay. think that's like yeah. The whole yep. thing about like old yep. school golf is that like it's so quiet and everyone's so proper and like I think that like, the new the the new ways of doing it is just like people going and getting a little drunk and getting a little rowdy and like yeah. getting hyped for golf, like nice shots. Obviously you got to be respectful during their backswing and everything, whenever they're shooting, but like people want to get loud for a nice shot, a hole in one, maybe. I just sent you guys on here, a picture of that, of the hole they're building for live. It's supposed to, I think it's supposed to fit a few more thousand than what they got at, uh, at the waste management, but it looks unreal. Where'd you it send looks it? looks sick. Right in the, the one chat we have on here. On Discord. Okay. The during recording chat. Yeah, 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 yeah. Take Dang, a look at that's that. wild. All right. Yeah, but live. Um, yeah, you know, pretty cool. Uh the the new hole they're building. It's over in Australia. I don't I don't really know. I mean, I, I'd imagine they do a few American I mean, I, I'm mostly American dates, but I mean, you'd imagine they do a few over there, uh, Saudi probably, which is they're gonna they're gonna go crazy on that golf course. But um, but yeah, that that's live. I mean, it's pretty obvious there's some there's some uh, some adapting being being made off both these leagues. But all right, let's get into it. Uh, players this weekend, great great weekend. Uh, we got TPC Sawgrass, beautiful course. People know that that. That's a good portion of my bets are coming from the fact that I'm looking at how guys like, let's say, I, look, for, first, let's start off with this. There are three guys I don't like this weekend based off history at at Sawgrass, um, with the exception of Patrick Cantlay. Uh, Patrick Cantlay plays, of course, well, but I just don't like him this week. I think he's been playing a little too hot. I think all three of these guys have been playing a little too hot. Um, I think... I think Rory this weekend, I don't I don't like him. Um just because he's been playing hot and I think age is catching up, unfortunately. Um I don't like Colin Morikawa this weekend. He hates he hates sawgrass. He doesn't make cuts there. I don't think he's gonna make it this weekend. Um but yeah, those are my three guys this weekend I don't like at all. Now, Rory McElroy, I, I said I like him for the Masters. That's a different story, different different type of turnout. Um, you know, I I hate to say people are taking an off week this week just because it still is the players and it's a big, it's a big one, but we know, we know where the eyes are focused. Uh, the, the, fuck, the, the, the masters is only less than a month, probably only a month away. Once they start uh, the players, will get. so there's some, there's some thought to that. Um, and, and this has always been kind of a little bit of a, you know, the fifth, the fifth cousin, the, the extra, the redheaded step child of the majors. And that's how it is this week. So, I still think guys are going to be going out there shooting hard, um, but I, I I expect guys like like Rory, guys like Patrick Cantlay, Pat, guys like Patrick Morikawa or 
Colin Morikawa, I'm sorry. I don't think they're gonna make cuts this weekend. I don't think uh I don't think they have a shot of winning it. Um but yeah, I, I'm gonna I'm gonna stay off those guys. On the other hand, in terms of uh winners this weekend, I like John Rom. Everyone likes John Rom. Uh he's probably I think he's number one ranked golfer in the world and there's a reason for that. The guy can't stop winning tournaments. I mean he, he really can't. I think he's looking to make a breakthrough with the players here and he's he's gonna have a big year in twenty twenty three with with some of these majors, and I think he's looking to get that start with the players. Um, I like him a lot, plus a thousand right off the bat. Um, he's he's a guy I have also uh, to you know make make cuts, make make everything top ten. I'm I'm fully in on John Rom Rom this weekend. He's plus a thousand thousand to win it. Plus thousand to win it, yes, sir. Who's got the best odds? I want to say it's it's. Uh, I mean, I know Scotty Scheffler also has plus a thousand odds. So, so he's another guy wow. I have to win it this week. Yeah, that's that's how that's how golf betting works, which is fun. Uh, let me pull up the uh, lines real quick. I can read through but, them here, Sam, if you'd like. Yeah, I'm gonna pull them up just for my for my. But give me the top five real quick. All right, here's the top five. Rory coming in number one at plus nine fifty. Scotty Scheffler coming in at one plus one thousand. John Rahm plus eleven hundred. Patrick Cantlay at plus sixteen hundred and Max Homa at plus sixteen hundred. Justin Thomas at plus seventeen hundred. That's the top six. Okay. I uh I have uh I have Rom or not Rom. I have uh I, I don't know. Homa, he's hit or miss for me. I've I've lost a few bets on him unfortunately lately, so I, I kinda hate playing him, but at the same time it's tough not to put him up there because he's one of the top ranked guys. He he's pretty consistently in the top fifteen. So I like uh I, I like Max Homa a lot for top twenty. Let's put it that way. I don't have that in my notes, but I have Max Homa top twenty, which I like a lot. Um some of my top forty guys, these two guys are minus one fifty, and I think they're few in for top forty. I got Will's Dalatoris and I got uh J- Jordan Speed, both at minus one fifty. Top 40. I love that. Jordan Spieth, I don't know if anyone caught any of the tournament last week. I can't imagine they did. But Jordan Spieth played like shit last week. He can't putt. He can't putt to save his life. TPC Sawgrass loves, loves guys who can't putt. I think Spieth is all over this one weekend. Um, I'd even tease him. I'd even say go go at him at, at, my, at top 20. I personally hate the guy from a, from a strictly – personal standpoint so i'm not putting him anything higher than top 40 but we'll get a top we'll go top 40 from will zalatoris too the kid who looks like happy gilmore's uh caddy top 40 easy money money and then out of him i I i'm trying to find the jesse can you pull uh what it would be oh no i have it right here okay so group c for for uh for this weekend it's gonna be uh, Hovland, Sungjae, Spieth, Kim, and Zalatoris. I like Will Zalatoris out of that group. He's plus 300 out of that group. I like that a lot. I'd say book it. Jordan Spieth's a little bit of a trouble there. I think Jordan Spieth's going to give him a run for his money. I think Jordan Spieth's going to end up top 40. I don't think he beats Zalatoris, though. I think Zalatoris is playing better golf right now. And I think... I, I I wish I had it. Sal Torres's history at Sawgrass eats. I I remember he eats that course alive. So I'd say keep him, keep him in your mind, uh, keep him in the back of your head. He could be he could be real trouble this weekend. Um, now this is my favorite part of the segment where we talk about live betting golf. That's where I make my money. These are four guys here that you're gonna want to keep in mind to live bet maybe. Saturday, maybe Sunday to get top five, top 10, even maybe win it. I got Jordan Spieth again, and I got Will Zalatoris again. Those two guys this weekend, outside of Scheffler and Rom, those are my show ins, but I, th- I think Spieth and Val- Zalatoris are going to have a weekend. I don't, I, something's just telling me. I don't know what it is. I think Jordan Spieth's been, been out of the light a little bit too long, and I think he needs to, to make his reemergence. Um, and, and Zalatoris is just playing good golf. Keep an eye on those guys for a live bet, uh, maybe top five, top ten. Like I said, maybe even to win it. Um, I also like Jason Day a lot this weekend. Jason Day is a guy who's a bit older. Um, he, he really took the world by storm whenever he started golfing, but he kind of fell off a little bit, and he's coming back on now. He's 35 years old. Um, 
playing some of the best golf of his life. I'd say keep him in mind for, for a little bit of a live bet this weekend. I wouldn't play him off the bat just because Friday or Friday, Thursday, Friday could go any which way. But those two guys are awesome. Or that guy's awesome. Um, keep an eye on him to, to possibly make a, make a little run at it. Um, now, this is, a, this is a fun bet because this isn't really in terms of any golfers. This is just something that I believe is, is going to happen, especially at a tournament like this. The winning stroke margin. The winning stroke margin of this this tournament is going to be one stroke. It's happened the past six times at TPC Sawgrass for this tournament. It's going to happen again. I'm telling you right now, that's a what is it? one what stroke. Odds? That's winning stroke margin is going to be one stroke. I want to say it's two seventy five, but let me do some research real quick. That's that's an interesting play because no matter who wins you're obviously in play mm-hmm. and that's you're hoping it's close. Find it on here. wait what is it again it's sam cut score winning stroke margin i'm gonna pull it up on draft chain real quick get that running for you but that that is going to hit like that's that might be my most sure bet of the weekend i'm gonna be honest with you it has nothing to do with a fucking golfer it's one stroke that's how it's gonna be because you it, guys, it's the players, and there's a ton of guys who want to win this thing. Who, you know, th- this is a tournament for guys like Will Zalatoris or guys like Jordan Spieth, who haven't won a lot lately. Guys like Hatton, guys like uh, even Fitzpatrick, they haven't won a lot lately. They want to get back into the game. The players is the perfect time to do that. That's why I hate playing guys like I like I, I, Scotty Scheffler and John Rom. Those are the only two guys right now who I'm just like this. These two are killing shit right now, and they're gonna they're gonna be in in the conversation. But other than that, that's why I don't like Rory. That's why I don't like I, I really don't. I mean, Homa is fun to watch, and it's it's cool to keep as a live bet. But off the bat, I don't love him because he's those guys aren't worried about this weekend. Rory McIlroy is not worried about this weekend. It, it's all about the Masters for those guys and guys like the, the, the middle of the pack guys. There's going to be a bunch of guys in the top five, top ten who are tied. And that, that last stroke on that last putt at the end of the day is going to matter a lot, and it's going to win the thing. I'm telling you, it's one stroke this weekend. No one's going to blow out. It's not going to happen. Now, I don't ah, – shit, I meant to check the odds on that. But, um, but yeah, that's that's the one I love the most. I TPC Sawgrass – Everyone knows that it's good. The, no one's going to go out there and blow it up. Yeah, I like that one a lot. Um, let me see what the the money looks like on this. But yeah, I don't know what it is. Regardless, it's going to hit. Find it. It's. I think it's like. I think it's like plus two fifty something crazy like that. Um, I got a question for you. Do you yeah, like Mo Zalatoris? Um, to beat Shane Lowry by uh, by a half a stroke and no, round. no, no. I like I like Lowry better than that. I think Shane Lowry's playing better golf than you've been casting up Zalatoris this entire time. Are you gonna go against him? <laughs> what do you mean? What do you mean? What do you mean? All you've been saying is how good Zalatoris is gonna do this time. Why do you think Shane Lowry is gonna beat him? Who'd you say against Shane Lowry? Zalatoris. Zalatoris. Oh, you said some name that didn't sound like Zalatoris at all, or some oh. r- broke up. I thought you, I thought you said some like Asian name. I was like, well, who are you <laughs> fucking talking about? No, yeah, no, Zalatoris yeah, no. minus a no, half I, over Shane Lowry. Yeah, I, I like that. I like, I like out of that. I don't know if he are they in the same group by chance. I don't know. It's a head to head matchup. They're not. Yeah, if that's head to head, I like that. Uh, I, I just. I, I don't know. I'm I'm sold on Zal Torres this weekend. If there's a dark horse guy, it's him. If there's a, a favorite guy, it's it's Scheffler. But those are the two guys this weekend. But it's going to be one by one stroke, not two, not three, one stroke. Unless it unless it goes to a playoff, which would fucking be unreal, unreal. And I I, I don't know. I think this might be one worth spreading a little money on to make a playoff. Like because there's. There's probably a little prop bet where you could say, oh, it makes playoff, whatever, this and that. I'd say go for that. Um, but, yeah, that's what I have for the players this weekend. Anyone got any questions? No. I'm taking Zalatoris over Shane Lowry. Yeah, dude. So. I like, I like Zalatoris this weekend. I, I The kid just keeps getting better, and it's crazy. It's, like it's literally too. insane. I like him too. It, it, he – 
if he could if he could putt, he'd probably be a top five golfer in the world. That's the thing though. That's why that's why putting is why, a like, big part of the game. Oh, it's it's the biggest part of the game. In exactly. my personal opinion, um I mean you've seen you saw you remember what happened to Dustin Johnson a few years back? He he three putted to lose that this was years ago, he three putted to lose that tournament and it was just the most insane shit. I'd have to find a video of what tournament that was. I want to say it was US Open. Dustin Johnson. That's tough. Three putt. Was it a three putt or yeah, 2015 US Open. Yep. Lost him 2.4 million dollars. That's crazy. That's why I went to the live. Needed to make back all that money. But yeah. But yeah, other than that, fellas, that's all I got for you guys today. Love it, Sam. Lots of good stuff there. Yeah, players yeah. this weekend, Masters coming up. We look forward to having you back on here soon to deep dive a little deeper into the Masters. Awesome, guys. Thank you for having me today. Uh, hopefully I can talk to you guys in a couple weeks, a couple bucks richer off Will Zalatoris' putting stroke. But, uh, but yeah, thanks, guys, and uh, I'll talk to you later. Sounds Thank good. Thank you, Sam. Yeah. Thanks, dude. Thanks Peace. for joining, brother. <laughs> All righty, lots of good stuff from Sam in the golf world. Let's jump back into the NFL. The first point I got here is Derek Carr inks a deal with the New Orleans Saints. Four years, $150 million, $100 million guaranteed. A NFC South bulking up there for the Saints. What do you guys think? Yeah, I've been saying this. I've been saying uh, if I'm a free agent quarterback, whether I'm a Derek Carr, Aaron Rodgers, any of these big names that are floating around in free agency, I'm, I'm looking at the NFC South. I'm picking my team and – that's where I'm going because it's a wide open division. I've been saying that, and the Saints are starting to – they finally got their guy, a quarterback, or at least we think, and a formidable quarterback in Derek Carr. I have faith in him to to go in there and have a pretty solid season with a weak division and a good defense and some good weapons around him and Alvin Kamara and uh, Chris Olave, Mike Thomas, if he can get a healthy Mike Thomas and a skill player like Taysom Hill. I do I, – I, I'm usually down on the Saints, and I really like this move for them. I think this is kind of what they needed. They were kind of – flirting like potential with Jameis and Taysom and they didn't really know what they had going for themselves at quarterback and I think now they got their guy and they have a guy that they can put faith in for the next four years for the duration of this contract yeah um Hoff you've been talking it up all se or all off season, I guess um just go to the NFC South try to make your uh try to make your mark there in a weak division you might as well right and um, I think this move puts them over that edge. They, they will take this division this year, but how far does it really get them in the in, in the grand? Exactly. Yeah. Um, they'll get to that. They'll probably be that um, f that fourth seed, the one that the last division or the yeah the last division winner. They're gonna play the the first wild card, who's usually gonna be a powerhouse. Um, and I, I think this could be another first round exit for another uh, NFC South division winner who d doesn't really deserve it. At the end of the day, I don't see this team winning more than ten games this season. Um, Derek Carr, he's good, but he's really not. Like, what has he proved? He hasn't really proved anything. He's yeah, he hasn't Devontae really Ad proven anything. He had Devontae yeah. Adams for for a full year. He had a lot of expectations this year. Obviously, nothing worked out. They're going their separate ways. But um, I don't know. This guy has a lot to prove. And if he does prove what I think he can, what he's capable of, um, this team could be a, a scary team. Uh, come in, in in a weak NFC, in my opinion. I don't think the NFC is definitely definitely the weaker conference out of the two of them. But um, yeah. Yeah, I mean, we could see what he could do, but I'm just, I just don't have a lot of confidence in this Saints team come playoff time. Yeah, I agree. All right, next point I got. Anthony Richardson said he felt an instant rapport on with the Seattle Seahawks and Pete Carroll. He also went on to say that something about their meeting was different. Anthony Richardson's draft stock has been soaring since the end of the college football season, and after an impressive combine, he is looking at to be one of the first quarterbacks off the board in this year's draft. Any comment on that? I obviously I watched this kid all last season and obviously he's an athletic, you know, freak. I just and the NFL combines all about your speed and jumping and skills and it's perfect for guys like that to go in there and just, you know, put a lights out performance for just a freak athlete, but I don't know. I'm very interested to see what where he ends up going because we've heard spots of him, you know, last the start of the season he wasn't even a first round quarterback, I don't think. And now, you know, he's projected a lot of these teams or people are picking that they're going to trade up to get him and go no, he could go number 1 to the Colts, he could go, you know, number 2 to the Texans, but the Texans seem like they're pretty sold on Bryce Young if he's there, but 
you know, I just – I've watched Anthony Richardson play. I never thought he was going to be, you know, a top, you know, top pick in the NFL draft, but – Props to him, whatever him and his team are doing down there, putting his name out there and his athletic ability. But uh, I'm interested to see where he falls on draft night. Yeah, uh, week one uh, of college football season this year, he had an incredible, incredibly athletic play. He, like, faked the through, rolled out, like, simultaneously. And by the, by the time the defense even knew where he was, he was, like, halfway to the end zone. Mm-hmm. Um, he had the one play against right- LSU, too, this year that was crazy. Yeah, so he right there. I, I thought I predicted he, predicted he was going to be a, a Heisman candidate. I was off about that, but he's just a crazy athlete, is what I've come to realize. Um, this is this is not a guy who's going to come in and just take over a franchise. He's gonna. I think he's going to have to come in behind somebody, mentor them, and um, I think Ace said it best. But this is a good spot for him to go into Seattle behind Geno for a year or two and see what he can do behind some behind a veteran, and then come in two years after a little experience in the practice squad maybe a few game reps but I, this isn't a guy i i think he's being a little a little too overvalued i think um you know what he's only played like 13 uh career he's only had like 13 career starts in, in uh, college football i mean you're looking way too far into it i don't know what made his stock rise so much maybe it's just his freak athleticism but um this isn't a guy that's gonna come into the league and make an immediate impact in my opinion yeah, I, I I agree with that. I think the best situation for him is to find somewhere with a with a quarterback that he can sit and learn from, or learn from, whether it be a guy like Geno Smith that's kind of been all over the depth chart for teams all across the league. I think that'd be a good situation for him up in Seattle. Very excited for the draft here coming up. Uh, is that around your birthday, Huff? Yeah, me and Mackie's yeah. birthday. It's always a week of our birthday. Right. That's what I thought. Yeah, coming up here around the end of April. So lots to look forward to when that arrives. Next point here, Calvin Ridley is finally reinstated from his gambling suspension. He was suspended in 2021 as a member of the Falcons and was forced to miss the whole 2020 season, 2022 season. He will come back to an already stacked Jaguars roster. How do we see him panning out with this Jack Jaguars team? I, th- I think, I mean, it's not necessarily the bold statement going into this year. This team was plus 750 going into last year to win the AFC South, and this year they're going to come in as probably the heavy favorite, I think, in my opinion, to win that division. And with the Texans in rebuild mode, the Colts in rebuild mode, and the Texans or the Titans obviously unloading and talks of getting rid of Derrick Henry, we'll get into that. But um, I think I think the only way is up for this Jaguars team, and they won a playoff game last year against the, uh, a struggling Char- Chargers team. Obviously, they came back from that crazy lead at the at halftime and um, battled back. This char- or this Jaguars team, I think the only way is up from there. And uh, they got guys like Trevor Lawrence, you said, leading the way. And the defensive side of the ball, they got studs all over the place too. So I think Jacksonville is definitely going to be a valuable team this year. A team that I was all over last year with some of those spreads. They were getting like 10 points in some of these games, or road games, and they were a consistent cover machine last year for me at certain points, and another team I'll have my eye on this year, but a lot of the rest of America will too, obviously, as they kind of are the big dog in that division. Not necessarily a, a powerhouse division, but kind of similar to the NFC South. Just got one team that if they can put things together, I think they're a shoe in to win the division. Yeah, um, Calvin Ridley missed the best possible part of his career. Um, he was on a terrible Falcons team. Obviously got suspended on that team, and then he gets traded to the Jaguars. Still, while the Jaguars are terrible, um, Jaguars finally get good. He gets reinstated, and he's back on the field to uh to help the team win a division. Uh, it's kind of kind of cool how it worked out for him. But um, yeah, I mean this Jaguars team has a lot of expectations this year. Obviously, Trevor Lawrence is being looked at as a top five quarterback in the league now. I think it's a little crazy to me, but he is a very good quarterback, and he has a ton of potential, and he's first round or first overall pick. So, um, but yeah, this. This um this Jaguars team has a lot of pieces now. Um, Trevor Lawrence should have a pretty good year this year, and that that division is not very not, not a lot of uh, competition to win that division. So, um, should be cool. Should be nice to have Calvin Lee back on that team. Yeah, good news there, getting him back in the league. All right, next point here. Down in Tennessee, the Titans are looking to shop star running back Derrick Henry. Henry has led the league in rushing yards two out of the last four years, including winning Offensive Player of the Year in 2020. Where do we uh, see Derrick Henry ending up? Anywhere big, any big cities? What do we think? 
I think this is the prime chance for the Buffalo Bills to go out and get the guy that they've needed. Uh, they made a move. They tried to make a move to bring home Christian McCaffrey uh, and go on that run that the we watched that San Francisco 49ers team go on. And I think the best fit for him is going to be up in Buffalo. It's just whether they can get the money to fit right or the assets to go back to Tennessee. But I think if I'm the Buffalo Bills, I'm going all in on getting a guy like Derrick Henry. Mackie, where do you think he's going? Yeah, I said I, it. I don't know. I'm kind of bad with these running backs. Um, there's a few good. Where are some good spots for him? I think a Buffalo, maybe a Kansas City. I think City, Buffalo, they have yeah, a Pacheco, definitely. But like, I I just think him going to a big team. Like, I don't think he's really looking to go anywhere. Like. I, I assume they're going to give – I don't know if he has no trade or what the deal is with – what his deal is with Tennessee, but I don't know. It's obviously going to be a best return situation, but one of these teams has to jump out and make a play. I just think Buffalo, maybe a Green Bay, if Aaron Rodgers comes back, you could have a – because I, I think A.J. Dillon had kind of a step back here last year, but I think and Aaron Jones – You'd rather, you'd rather um, Derrick Henry than A.J. Dillon or Aaron Jones. Yeah, obviously. exactly. I'm saying Aaron Jones and Derrick Henry. That's a nice duo up there in Green Bay to get right, say, hey, we're bring you know we've just got Derrick Henry. Why don't you come back and run it back a year? Um, I think there's a lot of shakeups going on, but I think the Buffalo Bills have to make a move here. I think you're right about the Buffalo Bills, but what does that do for their offensive game plan? I mean, it's all through Allen and his feet and his arm, and you're you're taking a lot away from him there. And if you're not taking anything away from him, then you're kind of wasting Derrick Henry and his value. Um, the Bills need something. It's clear. It's it's pretty obvious they need something to put them over the edge. They cannot get past those those two powerhouses. I guess you could say the the Bengals and the Chiefs and the AFC. Um, they need something to put them over the edge. And you know, if, if changing your entire offensive scheme to get Derrick Henry and make him valuable on that team is the answer, then I guess you got to do it. You got to try something. I mean, you're running out of valuable years here with Josh Allen and, and uh, the team that you have around it. Another another interesting landing spot would be, depending what happens with Joe Mixon and all these pending situations he has going on off the field, and could you imagine Derrick Henry in a Bengals uniform? If you send Derrick Henry to Cincinnati, that team is that that's that's the best team in the NFL, hundred percent. They'd be loaded because the way that they that they use their running like they use Joe Mixon right now. I mean, I know they have a few running backs back there because Joe Mixon hasn't always been a hundred percent. But P. Ron's have been filling in there for. He's you, done a great job there. But I'm saying if 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 Mixon really can't get his act together off the field, I could see the Bengals moving on and saying, okay, we have the top, a top running back in the league available here. We'll give you every draft pick. We're going for the Super Bowl. You know what I mean? Yeah, you you give you give Joe Burrow, Derrick Henry, and uh, things things will get messy. That'd be that'd be I'd, crazy. I'd love I'd, to see I think that. I think this is the Buffalo Bills situation to lose. I feel like they should be the front runner to get him. I don't know, like I said, how the money works out, but I think and maybe God, there's so many te- there's not really so many teams that need a running back, but like when you're getting a Derrick Henry, there's so many teams that it's like ship your running back and two first round picks and it's a good move, like but I like we'll see where he ends up going. Obviously Tennessee's just unloading everything, so he's definitely not staying there, I don't think. No, yeah, he's he's out of Tennessee. It's just a matter of time, and who gives him the who gives him the money and the deals. Well, well, no, he's still on contract, isn't he? Yeah, he's still under contract. It's gonna be just about the return that they get. Seems like they want to, like they're they're willing to get rid of him though. So, yeah, Did you take Dub V. No, I didn't. Are they playing right now? Very curious to see where Derrick Henry ends up for this upcoming season and lots more to look forward to in the NFL. Some big news out of Baltimore. The Ravens have placed a $32.41 million non-exclusive franchise tag on Lamar Jackson. He is now allowed to negotiate with other teams. Where do we see Lamar heading to? Uh, Lots of limbo in here. I've seen that teams are publicly coming out and saying that they don't want him. A tweet from J.J. Watt. Why are all these teams so publicly out on Lamar Jackson, MVP winner in his prime at the most important position in the entire NFL? What am I missing here? Curious to hear what you guys well, think J- about this. Go ahead. 
Well, JJ, here's what you're missing here, and this was a problem with him throughout his career. And the but your best avail your best ability is availability. We've said that a thousand times on this podcast. JJ Watt wasn't necessarily the most available player throughout his career, dealing with injuries, and that's no shot to him. A, honestly, one of the best defensive players of our generation. Him, JJ Watt. You think of uh, Aaron Donald, but um, in Lamar Jackson's case, I think the Ravens are really in the kind of have the upper hand here and they have the situation where they're used the franchise tag to their advantage and Lamar last year he comes into this offseason wanting fully guaranteed money I know he's won the MVP and all these other quarterbacks have gotten it but none of them have had really kind of the injury problems I know we've had some with the off the field issues in the Deshaun Watson case but Lamar I think he's a great quarterback but I think the Ravens are kind of playing their hand the hard way and I really think if they give him this money, it's not really going to put them in a good spot in the future. And as the NFL, we all know it's a business, and they're looking to the future. But um, I think we're going to see Lamar Jackson move on from Baltimore. I, th- I said that going into this offseason. I-, I wouldn't be surprised to see him sit out this year and pull the Le'Veon Bell. I don't think it's the smartest move, but I wouldn't be surprised to see him do that and uh, end up with another team next year. That'll ruin his career if he if he sits out a year, especially a player like him. Um, you can't sit out of the NFL for a year type of place that I don't think it would guys. hurt him that bad because he's so I th- I, injured he would not he would not come back the same no he wouldn't be the same but he would at least be somewhat he could say he had a year he like the uh, n- not injured <laughs> you know what I mean like the problem with him is that he wants a f- like a long contract like he, you are injury prone you're a running quarterback like this these were the all the worries coming into the coming into your career about you and even when you got good these were the worries about you the longevity of it um, it's happening. We're seeing it firsthand. Nobody wants to give you an eight-year contract that's worth four hundred million dollars. It's just not going to happen. Yeah, because he knows he's not going to have knees by the end of that deal. Exactly. So I mean, he he deserves a big deal. He's done enough. Um, he deserves to get out of Baltimore. But I, you're just not going to see a team hand eight years over to this guy. I just I think Daniel Jones is going to help him a lot. That deal was yeah, massive. I do. Yeah, that, that deal is going to help out everyone. Him getting like all quarterbacks. I yeah, think. that I that just... that agent is um, unbelievable. The fact yeah, that I just keep thinking off, like he's, he's the going rate for a quarterback now is forty million dollars for a guy like Daniel Jones is fucking crazy. Insane. Makes With, no sense. Granted, Daniel Jones had a good year, but what do you like? What do you really do? Is yeah, he gonna? Is, it was, is he oh, gonna boy. do it again? Yeah, it was evident. That it was exactly. Yeah, it was evident that the coaching was a huge difference with the Giants this year, and I think I'm I'm interested to see if he can keep the success rolling under Dayball with another year with Saquon. Obviously, Saquon gets the franchise tag, and Daniel Jones gets all that guaranteed money. I think it's pretty funny, but it's the world of the quarterback <laughs> and running back in the NFL. Did you see that? I saw a meme. It was it was like someone it, they were acting like Daniel Jones and uh, Derrick Henry was sitting on a bench, and they're they're not Derrick Henry, uh, Saquon. They were sitting on a bench, and Saquon sitting there all bloody, and it's like Daniel Jones explaining to Saquon Barkley why he's worth forty million a year for four <laughs> years, and Saquon Barkley's worth the franchise tag for one year. <laughs> that's that's the difference between a quarterback and a running back, though. It's crazy. Doesn't matter dude. who he, doesn't matter who you are. Yeah, uh, not sure what's going to happen here with Lamar Jackson. Yeah, definitely think he needs to get out of Baltimore, but we'll see what happens coming up here soon. I think that's going to wrap up everything we got this week. Another good week in the books, episode 28 of this season. Nothing else from me. You guys got anything else to add? All right, so I can do it. All right, so with March Madness right around the corner, we are happy to announce our second giveaway that we are going to be doing on the podcast. Stay tuned to our Instagram account for all the official rules and what you got to do to get entered. Kind of just the gist of it, it's going to go along with March Madness. You're going to submit your bracket to our group uh, called Hit the Books on ESPN Tournament Challenge. And basically, you're going to have to like the post, tag a couple of friends, repost, and submit your bracket for the chance to win sports tickets to an event of your choice. Um, But stay tuned for that. That posting for that is going to go live tomorrow, Thursday, March 9th. 
and will run up until brackets lock in on Thursday of next week. So um, definitely going to want to stay tuned for that over the next week as we get down to March Madness next week. Um, But other than that, that is going to do it for me. We will see you guys next week to go over some of these conference championships and college hoops and dive into the official March Madness bracket as we will have time to go over that next week as the bracket gets locked in on Sunday. Um, Other than that, March is finally here. Can't wait to get off this and watch some hoops right now. Other than that, thanks for listening. We'll see you guys next week. And that's going to do it for us on this episode of Hit the Books. Thank you to everyone who tunes in each and every week. Without you, we wouldn't be able to do what we do here. So please like, share, and subscribe wherever you can. And don't forget to check us out on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter for our plays each and every night in the NHL, NFL, MLB, NBA, college basketball, and college football. Thank you again and see you next week.